Man, this is the final day of uh, the crossover series. It's been quite a winter, I think. We started this back in January. Um, man, I, I, it's really helped me as, as the one who gets the privilege of really digging into the scripture and praying and trying to hear from God and what, he, you know, what he's trying to say um, through his word and being led by the word. I don't know about you guys, but I've been impacted by it as your pastor. Um, it's been an excellent series. Um, I've, my, my life has really been impacted by, by God through his word. And man, as we've seen um, in this study, to save the world uh, from our sins, God, he had to be born into the world. He had to be born into the world and uh, to, to die for us. And to do that, he had to start a lineage, right? How, how are you going to be born into the world? Well, man, you got to start a lineage. And this lineage uh, started with Abraham. Abraham was the first in the line to Jesus Christ. God started here. Man, in the life of Abraham, God started here. And that makes, that, that makes Abraham the first Jewish person. Or, or the first Hebrew person. And that word Hebrew, uh, it means to cross over. It means to, to cross over. And God, God revealed himself to Abraham. He crosses over into the world like he hadn't done before. Like he hadn't done before. And he revealed himself to Abraham crossing over into the world. And God called him on a quest. He called Abraham and his family on a quest. And each step of the way, God continuously calls Abraham to cross over, to cross over to, from the kingdom of the world to, to the kingdom of God, from an old way to a new way, from death to life, from an old life uh, into a new life. And we've seen uh, a person in Abraham and his family, his wife, uh, his, his nephew Lot, we've seen in his family people just like us. People just like us sin terribly and struggle mightily. We've seen people just like us. Man, when, when, when people think of Abraham, you know, some people worship Abraham. <laughs> some people worship Abraham. Man, and Abraham is not to be worshipped. Man, Abraham is a person just like us that God used despite his brokenness and his sin and his struggle. And in the middle of it all, what we're seeing is God's faithfulness. It's not Abraham's faithfulness. Abraham had his moments of faithfulness, but it was always the thread of God's faithfulness working through Abraham and his family's life. And man, God has been growing Abraham in faith. He's been growing Abraham in faith. He's been growing Abraham and his family in love for God, in love for him. And today, Today, in this kind of uh, sort of last text, uh, at least of uh, our series, uh, in the, this series with Abraham, God authenticates. God authenticates his faith. He authenticates Abraham's faith and his love for the Lord. And that's really what I'm calling this sermon. Uh, I love sermon titles. I mean, as Scott was saying, like, he didn't like sermon titles last week. And I like them, man. I'm calling this, series, this, this sermon uh, Authentication Process. I'm calling it authentication process. You know, I hate when I'm online. I hate when I'm online and, you know, like you log into something and to authenticate you, to make sure you're real and you're not a robot, like you have to click all the boxes that have a street light in them. I hate that. It's so annoying. It's so annoying. But they're trying to authenticate who you are. They want to know that, man, you're not just a robot. Or you're not, like a, you're not up to no good. You're an actual person trying to accomplish what the website is there to help you accomplish. Man, they want to authenticate you. And that, that's what God, really, he's been doing that all throughout this series in Abraham's life. But he's, man, he's really doing that today. Man, he is really challenging Abraham. He's really challenging Abraham and he's authenticating it and Guys, listen, authentication, authentication of our faith and our love for God, I'm going to tell you, it's not demonstrated by our, the fervor of our prayers. Authentic faith and authentic, authentic love for God is not demonstrated by a fervor of prayers, emotionalism, and worship. It's not. Intensity of witness. Man, intense intensity of evangelism. It's not. That's not what authenticates our faith and our love for the Lord. There's only one way to authenticate our faith. That's obedience. 
It's obedience to the Lord. It's obedience to God. When God gives a command, man, do we carry it out? Do we carry it out? Do we listen? Do we listen to the Lord? That's what authenticates our faith. That's what authenticates our love for the Lord. Do we obey him even when it doesn't make sense? Even when it doesn't make sense. I mean, if we say we love him, we'll obey him. We'll obey him. I mean, this is convicting for me. We'll obey him no matter what. If we say that we love him. You know, our life is best lived when God has no rival. When God has no rival and we're obedient to him. But what gets in the way of obedience? Idols. Idols. The idols of our life. Man, you know, the central principle of the Bible, the central principle of the Bible is the rejection of idolatry. When you look at the Bible from like a 30,000 foot view, okay, what, what, is, what is like God trying to get at? What is the central principle of the Bible? And just the singular thread that runs through everything It's the rejection of idolatry. It's the rejection of idolatry in our lives. And what that means is just worshiping created things. Worshiping created things in the world. And and not worshiping the creator of the world. Man, Paul summarized it good. Man, just a few words. Paul summarized it in Romans 1. They worshiped and served created things. Not the creator. They worshiped and served the created things and not the creator. Paul says that. And when we think of worship, man, we think of physically kneeling down, right? We think of just bowing down and physically kneeling down on our knees down to something. But man, that's not all it is. And it's not even actually really close to what it is. That's not all it is, man. It's our heart's disposition. It's our heart's disposition. We worship something when we look to it to give us ultimate joy and ultimate happiness and significance, and purpose in our lives. Man, we worship something when we we ask these things. Man, if I don't have this, I can't be happy. Man, if I don't have this thing in my life, a created thing, if I don't have this thing in my life, I can't live on. Every human must live for something. All these created things in the world, whether it's, it's money, it's money. Maybe, maybe it could be sex. It could be power. It could be power. It could be relationships. Man, it could be, it could be a spouse. It could be a dream. Not a literal dream like, you know, while you're sleeping, but just like a dream. Like, man, I dream of doing this. I dream of accomplishing this. I, I have this dream. That can be an idol. It can be material things, man. It can be a car. It could be a home. It could be so many things. Man, if if I don't have this, I can't live on. If I don't have this, I'm not happy. I don't have joy. It could be comfort. That's a big thing in our world, comfort and convenience. Comfort and convenience. And the way God authenticates us and grows us is by continuously pitting us against our idols. Always. He's continuously pitting us against our idols. And today, God continues to authenticate Abraham's faith by confronting a growing idol in his life. And we also see that God, he actually does this by demonstrating to us how much he loves us. How much he loves us. God, in authenticating us, he does it by authenticating himself and his love for us. We can't grow into authentic faith, authentic love for the Lord, if he doesn't come down and show us how much he loves us. It doesn't work. It doesn't happen. He has to show us that he loves us. And then we can grow in authentic faith, in authentic love for the Lord. Man, let's get into the text. In the first couple verses in chapter 22, Genesis 22, and it's on the screen. It says this, it says, after these things, God tested Abraham. He tested him. This is a test. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering 
on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Man, I don't even have to go any further. Now, that is challenging. That's challenging stuff, man. That's challenging stuff, man. I, I think to, to understand this, we have to kind of go backwards a little bit in the Genesis text and really go back to where we started in Genesis 11. In Genesis 11, when first introduced to, to Abraham and Sarah, one of the first details we learn about them is that Sarah is what? She's barren. She's barren. She doesn't have the ability to have a child. She's barren. And that's, that's, a, that's a real struggle for people. And that, it should be, man. That's okay. In my experience of knowing people who can't get pregnant, it's a serious, legitimate struggle. And our hearts should go out to, to, to a situation like that. But we learn that Sarah is barren. And in that ancient culture, in that ancient culture, sons were highly desired. Man, you know, even today, like, I want a son. I do, because I'm the last doe back. So it would be nice to have a son to continue that name on. But, you know, it's not like, it's not a hugely significant thing, you know, to me. Back then, man, it was everything. It was everything to have a son. It was everything for a family to have a son in that culture. A son carried on the family name. A son carried on the family name. The oldest son got the majority of the estate and the majority of the wealth so the family would not lose its place in society. That's what a son did. Now, in an individualistic culture like today, in an individualistic culture like today, an adult's uh, identity and sense of worth are bound up in abilities and achievements. Abilities and achievements. That's where our identity is these days. I fall into that. It's, it's abilities and achievements in ancient times. All their hopes and dreams, all their hopes and dreams of a man and a family rested in a firstborn son and having a son. That was the deepest desire of a person's heart, of a man's heart, of the wife's heart. It was to have a firstborn son. And then we go to Genesis 12. God calls Abraham to him. God calls Abraham to him. Now, Abraham, he wasn't like a believer in Yahweh, the God of Israel, this, this real living God. Man, he was an idol worshiper in that city of Ur, the Chaldeans. And God, he just comes into his life and he calls him and he singles out their greatest disappointment for his greatest purposes. He calls Abraham and he singles out their greatest disappointment for their, his greatest purposes. Their barrenness. Their barrenness. And he promises them that they would have their own child. <laughs> it would be a son. May he makes that promise. They would be blessed and they would be a blessing to the world. They would be a blessing to the world. And as the years turned into decades, as we saw in this study, man, the promises became more and more difficult to believe, right? God says he's going to do something. And man, you just wait and you wait and you wait. He ain't doing anything. And you wait. That's hard. The promises became difficult to believe and waiting became excruciating. Waiting became excruciating. And that's when we get to Genesis 16. We get to Genesis 16. We see they struggle with this. This is a real struggle for them. Man, they want this son so bad. For all of those ancient cultural reasons, they want this son so bad. And, and even for these like promises that God is talking about. And to make God's promise happen, they force the issue in their own strength. And what, what, what happens? Man, Sarah gave Abraham over to her servant, Hagar, to have a child. And they do it. They have a child. They try to make God's promise happen in their own strength. In their own strength. They sin. They sin to do it. And guys, that's how we know we have an idol. That's how we know that we have an idol in our life. An idol is loving something more than God. Loving something more than God, and the way we know it's an idol is by looking at where we're sinning. Where are we sinning? Guys, this dream, this desire for a son, it was everything to them. It was everything to them, and it led them to take things into their own hands and sin against God. That's how we know that they have an idol, and their idol is this dream, this desire, this son they were idolizing this, this idea of a son. The center of life had shifted from dependence on God, 
from dependence on God to this idea of a son and all he could bring them. The center of their life shifted. And then we go to Genesis 21. God finally gave them a son. He finally gives them a son and Abraham gets what he always wanted. He gets it. They get what they always wanted. His deepest desire was filled. No man had ever wanted a son more than Abraham. He had waited, they waited, and they sacrificed for decades. And finally, it's here. Finally, the son is here. And now here, Genesis 22, verses 1 through 2, God places a confounding call on them. <laughs> he places a confounding call on Abraham. It's like, it's like a, wait, what moment? Wait, what did you just say? <laughs> What did you just say, God? Can you say that again? So I can hear you clearly? Await what moment? And it was says God was testing Abraham. Man, he was pitting Abraham against an idol. He was pitting Abraham against an idol, the idol of his son. The idol of his son. And the question was now, had he been waiting and sacrificing for God or for the boy? Was he waiting and sacrificing for God or was he doing it for the boy, right? Was God just a means to Abraham's own ends? Was he just a means to the son? Was it really the son that Abraham wanted and not God? Was it just the son that he wanted? Who was Abraham ultimately giving his heart to? Who was he giving his heart to? Man, had he learned to trust God alone, to love God for himself, not just for what he could get out of God? Was he just loving God just, just because he could get something out of him? It was really the son that he wanted. It wasn't God himself. Man, this is, this is, this is, this is an authentication. God is challenging him. He, it says that he's testing him. This is an authentication process. Listen, God wasn't saying you can't love your son. He wasn't saying you can't love your son, but you must not turn to him as an idol and love him more than me. We must not love something more than God. So here we go in Genesis 22, verses 3 through 8. It says, so Abraham, this is his response, so Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went both of them together. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. He said, behold, the fire and the wood, but, but where's the lamb? Where's the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. And so they went both so they went, both of them, together. How does God, how does Isaac go up this mountain? God is calling him to sacrifice his own son. How does he do it? How does he climb up that mountain? Man, I have girls, like, I just can't imagine that. I can't imagine that. Now, this, this text, this is a, it's a controversial text. This is a specific command that really happened to a specific person at a specific time in biblical history, in the history of the world, God's not going to call any of us to, to sacrifice our child like that today. This was a specific command at a specific time for a specific person in the history of the world and in biblical history. Man, how? How does he do this? How does he walk up that mountain I think one of the keys is, is God, you know, he didn't just simply ask, to, ask him to sneak into the tent and kill him in his sleep. He didn't ask him to do that. He didn't ask him to do that. What did he say? He, he told him to sacrifice him as a burnt offering. As a burnt offering. This was an exchange for his sins. That's what this was. This was an exchange for his sins, and he had to do it. Abraham knew, I had... 
He had to do it. He had to go up that mountain. He knew this was an exchange for his sins. He had to do it. He had to go up that mountain. And this was the dilemma that Abraham faced. God has given me a promise, right? The promises that we saw in Genesis 12. You will be a blessing. This, this, the Messiah is going to come from Isaac, from your son. The Messiah is going to come and you're going to be blessed. Your family is going to be blessed. The world is going to be blessed. Through this son, Isaac, he's made these promises and experience has shown, as we have seen in this series, that God always delivers. Always. He always delivers on his promises. And he told him through Isaac, right, this is the way Abraham is thinking. Well, God told me that through Isaac, we will become a great nation and the world will be blessed. But Isaac can't fulfill that promise if he's dead, right? He's made this promise, but now he's telling me to sacrifice him. But then if I sacrifice him, the promise can't be, it can't be, it can't be met. It can't be, it can't happen, right? If he's dead. Now God asks me to sacrifice Isaac? Think about that. So we've seen since January that Abraham has learned that God is both holy and he's just. Man, we saw that uh, in, in the story about Sodom and Gomorrah. God is a holy God. He is perfect and holy, and he is just. Justice has to happen for our sin. And we saw that in that story about Sodom and Gomorrah. He is holy and just. And though we have seen in, this, in these scriptures that God is also loving and kind and gracious. Those two things, remember, several weeks ago I was talking about, it's hard for us to reconcile them together, but they do. God is holy and just, and he judges, and yet he is a God of love and kindness and graciousness. So Abraham is thinking, God is holy. God is holy. My sin means that my son is forfeit. My son is forfeit. Yet God is also a God of grace. He said he's going to bless me. (laughs) How can God be both holy and just and still fulfill his promises? How can he do that? Well, Abraham didn't really know. (laughs) Abraham didn't really know, but he went. He went. He didn't go up the mountain saying in his own strength, I can do it. I can do this. He didn't muster up the strength like, man, I got this. I can do this. This is incredibly difficult. He didn't muster up the strength and say, I can do this. You know, last time we saw that, last time they did that in Genesis 16, 16, with Hagar and taking the promise into their own hands and birthing that son. (laughs) That's when they tried to do it. Well, he's not doing that here. I guess he's learned. He marched up the mountain knowing somehow, somehow God would remove the debt of his sin. He didn't know how and yet still keep the promise of grace. And we see that in the scripture where he talks to his servant and he says, we will come to you again. He says, we will come to you again. He's talking about him and his son. Him and Isaac, we'll come back to you. You can, already, you can see in his head, he's thinking about how this is going to happen. He doesn't know how it's going to happen. But he had confidence in God that he was going to fulfill his character of his holy and his ju- holiness and justness and his grace and loving kindness. He knew his sin required a sacrifice. He knew he had to do this. And yet also knew that God would provide, but he didn't know how. He didn't know how. He marched up. He marched up that mountain, and he could do it because he was focused not on how crazy it seemed. He wasn't focused on how it didn't make sense. He wasn't focused on how it didn't make sense, but he focused on the character of God. I know you are holy, and I know you are just, But I also know that you are loving and you are kind and you are gracious. He will fulfill his promises. Guys, this is astonishing faith. This is astonishing faith, not blind faith. This is not blind faith. Blind faith would be not knowing the character of God and the promises of God and just stepping. That would be blind faith. I don't know anything about God. Right? I don't know his character. I don't know his promises. 
I'm just going to go and just step out. That will be blind faith. Abraham is not operating in blind faith. He knows the character of God and he knows his promises. He is stepping out in astonishing, legitimate, authentic, authentic faith. Authentic faith. He really believed that he had to do this. He really believed that he had to do this, that he had to make this sacrifice. He did. He wasn't thinking in his head, I'm going to go up there and, you know, I know just at the last second God's going to make me not do this. He wasn't thinking that, man. He really believed that this did have to happen, but he also really believed that God would somehow provide another way. And let's continue and see what happens. Verses 9 and 10. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. He took the knife to slaughter his son. Here we go. Man, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? Verses 11 through 14. But... The angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know. For now I know that you fear God. Seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his thorns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. Now I know that you fear the Lord. Authentication authentication. Now I know that you fear the Lord. We learn that this, this test was about loving and trusting God supremely. Loving and trusting God supremely. God said, now I know you fear me because you did not withhold your son and your only son from me. Now that fear, that word fear, it's not a Halloween type fear. Like, you know, where kids are scaring each other and you're frightened. That's not what this fear is, but it's loving awe, loving awe and wonder, wonder and, and amazing wonder of his greatness, this loving awe. So God is basically saying, now I know that you love me. Now I know that you love me more than anything else in the world. Authentication. Now I know. Abraham his faith and his love for the Lord is authenticated. And God is showing us how he authenticates his own love for us. Guys, nothing can give us this authentication of God's love but an experience of his grace and his forgiveness. Nothing can do it. We can't muster it up in our own strength and just, man, if I can just love God more, I can do it. No, we can't. We need God we need God to authenticate his love for us. And nothing can do that but an experience of his grace and his forgiveness. Nothing can make us love God more, more than his love for us being driven home into our hearts continually, daily, hourly, moment to moment. And in this case, to provide another way for sins to be forgiven, God showed up. God showed up and he provided a ram Abraham didn't know how it was going to go down. God, you're holy and just. I know you are, and you are gracious and loving and kind. I'm going to obey you. It doesn't make sense. I'm going to obey you, but I know you, and I know your character, and I know who you are, and I'm going to do this. I see that I have to do this. I have sin. But you're going to provide another way. And he did. God provided another way. God wasn't asking Abraham to do anything that he wasn't willing to do himself. Man, 2,000 years later, God the Father offered up God the Son, God's only Son, Jesus Christ. And because of Jesus, we can say to God, now I know that you love me. Because of Jesus, 
God authenticated his love for us on the cross, and we can mirror those words. Now I know that you love me because you did not withhold your son and your only son. Now I know. Now I know. Authentication. Guys, knowing what Christ has done, man, how, how do we live now? How, how, how do we live now after knowing this? Well, we identify an idol by looking at where our sin is. By looking at where our sin is. Is there something you can't seem to be satisfied without? Is there something that you just can't seem to be satisfied without and it's causing you to sin? And it's causing you to sin and causing pain in your life. Trace your idol. Trace your idol by looking at where your sin is. And we often sin when our Isaacs, when our idols, when our Isaacs are being threatened. When they're being threatened. God, our, our Isaacs could be, it could be love, it could be money, sex, power. It could be a child, just like Abraham. It could be a child. It could be a child, a relationship, a, a dream, a spouse, material things, comfort and convenience. It doesn't mean we can't enjoy things. It doesn't mean we can't be excited about things. That's no. We can enjoy things and be excited about things. But is it our number one thing? Is it our number one thing? We have to keep them in check. God is constantly challenging me on my idols. Constantly. Man, when I started following Jesus, everything I do, everything I do, man, I, get, I got into ministry. I left the golf business and I... That, that in itself was an idol of mine, was my, my achievements and my abilities and my career as a golf professional. And he challenged me on that. I sacrificed that Isaac up to him. God, it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not God to me anymore. You're my God. Now, he didn't take it away from me yet, but he demoted it below him, which is what needed to happen. Man, and then I got out of the golf business because he was calling me in, into pastoral ministry. So I do that. Right? And then it's ministry. Are you idolizing your ministry? Is that what makes you happy and significant? Even ministry can be an idol. Doing something good like this, preaching and doing like this, that can be an idol. And it causes me to step back. God, this is kind of, you know, it's kind of consuming me. And man, it, I had to ask myself, if, if God took this away, would it just end me? <laughs> Would it break me? And there was a time when, there was a moment when I could say, yes, it would probably break me. But man, I just, I, I gave it over to God again. I coach a high school golf team. I've been doing it for seven years now. I absolutely love it. I love it. <laughs> I love it. It's totally my wheelhouse. I love mentoring and leading these kids, right? But about a couple years into, my, into the job, I noticed that I was really, really loving it, like a lot. And I felt God was speaking to me, and he was saying, you know, if I took this away from you, would it break you? Would it break your spirits? And there was a moment when I said, yes. So I gave it up to him. God, please help me. Take this from me. Maybe not literally, but just take it from my heart, my, this, this desire. Now, I still love it. But man, God has helped me demote it below him. And now I can freely do what he's calling me to do in this position as a golf coach. Man, and if he takes it away one day, I'm fine with it. I'm fine with it. I'm good with it. It's all good. Man, this church, this church, church planting can be so consuming. And I love it. I love you guys. You know, I love this church. I do. And in the, in the very beginning, it was consuming. It was, it was starting to become an idol. Guys, I'm telling you, idols creep up. You don't even know when it's happening. And all of a sudden, one day you wake up and you've got this idol that if it went away, it would break you. And I had to give it up to God. I'm giving it up to God. God, this has become an idol. And what you've noticed is oftentimes, God, he's not looking to just take the thing away from you. He just wants to demote it in your life. It's okay, you know, if, 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 you know, if you like going on vacations, or I don't know, it could be so many things. But the question is, is, is it the number one thing? He just wants you to demote it in your heart below him. 
That's what he's doing. He's challenging us and he's pitting us against our idols. Guys, we may not realize it, but how idolatrous our career might be. You know, you all have careers. Our career can really be an idol in our lives until we're faced with a situation. Maybe we're telling the truth or acting with integrity would mean a serious blow to our advancement. It would mean a serious blow to our advancement. And if we're not willing to hurt our career in order to be obedient to God, if we're not willing to do that and to do his will of truth and integrity, our job has become an idol. Remember, trace that sin. Trace that sin. Where are you not acting with integrity? Where are you not acting with integrity and truth? And if you're not willing to hurt your career in order to be obedient to God, then your job has become an idol. We love it more than God. We trust it more than God himself. But because of the cross, we can trust him. No matter what. No matter what. Even if it seems like my job is on the line, man, oh, I gotta lie. If I don't lie, I might get fired. Trust God. Be obedient and trust God. Guys, maybe you like to make people laugh. There's people like this. Maybe you like to make people laugh. You know, you love the attention and the prospect of how people might think of you, right? As a really funny person, you know, and it really breaks you. It really breaks you when people don't laugh or, or respond the way you want. So in despair, you compromise your integrity and you tell completely inappropriate jokes. <laughs> it happens all the time. You tell completely inappropriate jokes just so you can pump up your self-image as a funny guy. Man, your idol is your own self-image. Your idol is your own self-image. Man, trace your sin. Where, where are you sinning? Trace your idol by looking at where your sin is. Guys, that college admission scandal. The college admission scandal recently, like a month ago. A bunch of people, celebrities, paying off somebody to illegally get their kids into college. One of them spending half a million dollars to illegally gain admission for their child to get into USC. Why? Why are they doing that? Why are they doing that? Why, why are they going to those lengths? They sinned by lying and deceiving. Look at where your sin is. They were lying and deceiving. Their idol is not a college education. It's not a college education. It's the social status. It's the social status and the self-image that they believe they would get by going to a certain college. If we can just get her into USC, then we will look good. We will get the social status and the self-image. And you know what? We're going to compromise our integrity and we're going to sin against God to make it happen. Our self-image and social status is an idol. It's an idol in our lives. Guys, may, maybe we mistreat our spouse. Listen to me. Maybe we mistreat our spouse because we have this distorted idea in our minds and we get it from pornography, men. We get it from pornography, this distorted idea in our minds of how our, our wife should be or should not be. We get it from pornography, media culture, movies, and shows, and we resent them for it. We're comparing them to what we see on TV. And we resent them for it, and we treat them badly for it. Your idea, your, your idol is not pornography. Your idol is this idea. Your ID, this idea that you have of how you think that your wife should be. Because you see all this stuff in pornography and on TV and the media and culture and shows and movies. And your wife is not living up to what you see on TV. Your idol is this idea. This idea of what you think your wife should be. And she doesn't live up to it, so you mistreat her. The sin. Trace your idol back to your sin. Guys, God is calling you. He's calling us. He's calling me continually to sacrifice our Isaacs. 
And most of the time, he's not going to take it away. He just wants you to demote it below him and make him number one. Make him at the center of your life because he's telling you, you are not going to be satisfied. Man, my wife asked me just a couple weeks ago, I think, as you, most of you know, I've lost almost 40 pounds now since Thanksgiving. And thank you. And, uh, you know, there's kind of a little bit in me, like, you know, I, I was really out of shape. I was overweight. Um, and I just wanted to make changes. There was a little bit in me, you know, that uh, something, a little bit had to do with self-image, you know, and something selfish inside of me wanting to look good and, you know, and all that stuff. So I did it. I lost all this weight. And my wife asked me, she was like, so how do you feel, you know? And I was like, well, you know, I feel good physically. You know, I feel good physically. I do. I feel great physically. Amazing. Best I've ever been in my life. But like, I'm not like satisfied. You know, I'm not satisfied. I'm not, my soul, you know, it's not satisfied. My spirit is not satisfied by, by this change, this weight loss. It's not, it's not gonna satisfy me. It's not gonna satisfy you. Nothing but Jesus satisfies us. Only Jesus. Jesus and him alone satisfies us. I said, it, do, it doesn't mean we can't enjoy things and be excited about things. I've enjoyed being in good shape. I have. But man, it hasn't satisfied my soul. Nothing will satisfy your soul but Jesus. Guys, that is what we have seen in this series with Abraham. I'm going to conclude here. That is what we have seen. Romans 8.32 says, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give all things? We can trust him because of the cross. I know I can sacrifice my idol because of the sacrifice that God provided. I can trust him. And that's what we've seen in Abraham's story. God has loved him so well. He has been so faithful to Abraham. He has loved him so well despite his sins. And it's been his love that has propelled Abraham in his love. Abraham's love grows as he understands God's love for him. And Abraham's putting away his idols. Abraham has crossed over. He's crossed over only, only because he's learned that it's God who has ultimately crossed over. It's God who ultimately crosses over. That's the only way that we can.